Don't just come back. What is going on, you guys? This is Brandon. Stephanie. You guys really need to come up with a more bombastic opening title. <laughs> you gotta assert who you are in the world. You gotta right. have some presence and some gravitas. You know, like take it seriously, you guys. Yeah, I mean, no, we were no going for now. more of a Game of Thrones kind of thing, you know. No. <laughs> yeah, I know you didn't get it. Right. <laughs> it was the funniest thing when I was going over the intro with our with our guy Manny, who's here today. I was like, um, he's like, "What do you want?" I'm like, ah, "I love the Game of Thrones intro. Just make it not three and a half minutes." <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're good, note. Um, good note yeah so, <laughs> anyway you guys welcome back to creators corner this is a show where we try to connect you guys with your favorite creators have them come on talk about their work we have an amazing show today we are talking with two of my favorite people two of our favorite people in the comic book world they ha- they've been in, in the game for years man we got terry dodson you know him with wonder woman you know with an uncanny x-men Harley Quinn, X-Men Fantastic Four, um, Generation X, I believe, Defenders, so many credits to his name, amazing artist. Even if he's not doing interiors, he's always throwing out amazing covers. Terry, thank you so much for being here today. Hey, and thanks for having me here, Brandon. Uh, no Appreciate problem. it. And we, uh, we have uh, Matt Fraction, who's uh, done a little bit of uh, fun stuff, did a, did a fun Hawkeye run that has turned into a TV show. Uh, you guys may have a Christmas seen TV show. A Christmas TV show. <laughs> it's gonna, it's gonna the... outlive me. It's gonna outlive us all. It's now part of the Disney holiday canon. It's gonna never. That, that show's gonna live forever. Facts. Okay, so your next Christmas movie. This is what you're gonna want to watch instead of watching Christmas Vacation. You know, watch. Seriously, our... it's so Christmassy. It's great. Yeah. Right. <laughs> also, did some work with Iron Man. Did some work with Iron Fist. Uh, did a great book called Sex Criminals. Did some Thor. Did a lot of stuff for Marvel back in the early 2000s. Guys, thank you so much for being here today. Absolutely. Thanks for having really, us. It was really late 2000s. I just, yeah, I just, I just early oh, 2000s yeah. just makes me feel old. I was, <laughs> that makes me feel young because I was born in 2001. So, <laughs> whooper snapper. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. That's like you're not helping. Oh, that's uh, all right. Oh, great. It's great. That's all right. That's like, uh, I feel old. He's like, a... Uh... Yeah, so when you were six, I was pitching Iron Man. Great. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I think I was drawing Harley when you were born. Yeah. Yeah. What were you guys doing beforehand? <laughs> I worked Maybe. in uh, motion graphics and like design and animation and stuff. Like it kind of like advertising. I worked in advertising and comics was like my night job. You know, it would, comics was what I did, so I didn't have a client. And then uh, I ended up getting paid to do it little by little and then got tired of doing that and we were going to have a kid and I knew that like if we had a kid I wouldn't it was, it was I mean it was great it was creatively fulfilling and it paid well and I knew that if it was creatively fulfilling enough it wasn't what I wanted okay. to do though and I knew that once it, that wasn't a rhetorical question was it that you asked you just asked a joke and then I gave a serious answer to like a gag <laughs> question so I'm wondering now but anyway yeah, no, I, I, we were. My wife was pregnant, and I was like, "Well, if I got nine months to start the career I want to have, or I'm never going to leave advertising." So, I got so that's why you chose. Right, that's why you chose to pitch Tony Stark. No, I got. I I was writing Punisher and Iron Fist with Ed. Yeah. When I made the leap, and then I just started pitching for stuff I wanted, and I got invited to an editor. I wrote a. I wrote an. I wrote an annual that everybody really liked up there, a Spider-Man annual that, that, that kind of earned me a seat. And yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I, Iron Fist was doing well, and and this, I, at that annual at Iron Fist kind of earned me a seat at this editorial retreat. Uh, and in the retreat, I pitched Iron Man because they had like a, a, what's it called? An agenda of like, oh, here's what we're going to do. This is, and, then, and then like on the bottom was like, Iron Man movie in May. New series? Question mark. Because there's already another Iron Man book. When we, when me and Salvador started, it, we were the other Iron Man book. We were the movie tie-in book. That we came out. Our first issue came out the Friday or the the Wednesday after the movie opened. Oh um, yeah. So yeah. so it was. We were supposed to just be the mini series that lasted right. um, a um, lifetime. But ended up. But it was supposed to just last like six issues or whatever, and it ended up. You're right. Now, when did you guys find out? That they that book was going to go beyond the pretty quick. Um, yeah. It just sort of kept going, 
and <laughs> like, but like I've I've written more Iron Man consecutively than anybody else. Wow, because uh, Salvador is such a machine. <laughs> but like, we were basically publishing bi monthly the entire time. We did like sixty eight issues or something like that in like bi weekly. Bi-weekly. Yeah, bi-weekly. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, right. It was yeah, almost like, like, every, like the average after like every three weeks an issue came out. And okay. it was always South of the world, like so um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was like it was like grabbing a you know like in a cartoon when like uh or what was it there's a Buster Keaton thing where he reaches out and he grabs the railroad and then <laughs> yanks him out of frame. <laughs> that was what working with Salvador Loro is like, like ah! Yeah. Anyway, I, that wasn't yeah. really a question that you asked, but I just it took ten minutes to bring it cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys I, are good. I appreciate the answer, the response. That was cool. <laughs> um, so Adventure Man, you guys got started when uh, during your time on X Men. Talk about what really happened because I know at the time you guys were trading off of Greg Land doing issues. How did Adventure Man really get started? What was the initial pitch? If you guys can give us the rundown of everything. Um, uh, Matt and I were doing a uh, run of X Men that took place in New York City. And uh, I, I love drawing New York, and I, I'm 95% we we're sure we were doing a promotion signing in San Diego, and Matt, was, Matt and I were together, and, and I said to him, you know, if you ever want to do something else in New York, let me know. And he said, I have an idea for New York, and, and that was Adventure Man. And I believe it was like eight, eight months later or so, he sent me, sent me the pitch. And this was like 2010 or so, and uh, that, that was the beginning, the, yeah. the love of New York City. So New York City is really like the the extra character of, uh, of adventure man that we, um, you know, is a huge part of that series really embrace that, love that. And, um, it's, it's the, um, it's kind of, you know, it obviously is the tie between the old and the new, you know, pulling the yeah. old New York into the new New York. And, um, it's such an amazing place to, uh, to set a comic book. Obviously the Marvel universe figured that out and we're just, you know, we're playing with playing with the old part of it. And, um, and, uh, it, it it's just been a great, uh, uh, a touchstone, I think, for us, um, uh, for the for the series, right? Yeah, and we, I remember now, we. we oh, I'm sorry, step what? Oh no, I I was just uh, curious when you guys. So you, early on, you knew it was going to be Adventure Man, like the pulp story you wanted to tell. So, so did like other projects get in the way, or like did you get? Was it like timing stuff? Yeah. That, um, did you guys want to get it off sooner and just scheduling kind of? Hindered that? Yes. Well, a part of the a part of the 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 thing that we I remember there's the earliest conversations of being like we need to do something that isn't on a 28 day publication cycle like a comic book mm -hmm. at Marvel, right? Marvel. The thing about it, like look, you can be on the X Men train or someone else is going to be right, and so. It was like let's we should do something that doesn't have to just it wasn't we never got to spend the time that we wanted to on those on those issues it was always a, a sort of a, a well that, like it's got to go it's got to be done so we're like we should do a thing that we can just do our way how we want and like like can build it and and sort of take the time it needs to make it the, the, the thing you know and sort of the 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 size of the of the collection was kind of like. The, the starting place like we wanted yeah. you know what i mean like terry had, had, terry had done the series called red one uh, uh with the french publishers it was in a, in a large so he, terry had kind of just come from that oh no it's the page like like that kind of experience of, of, of working yeah. in a more like a folio kind of book like, so we yeah, started from that like, what, yeah. what do you think of what do you think of a book that's you know, and like let's yeah yeah let's let's make it let's make it exactly let's not compromise right let's make it exactly right right absolutely right, right. Yeah. And is that why you guys went for that oversized format like this in the collected? Correct. The 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 I actually draw the book to be printed in that format. Right. The the, comp, the comic book is actually a bit of a compromise, but it's it's a planned compromise because that's how so many people read the book. But the right. book is actually from day one drawn on oversized paper at that wider, bigger format. So that is like the just the normal way it should be seen. So right. it's not really so much the, it's not so much deluxe or, or premium or whatever. It's just kind of like the standard format. The the premium part of it, at least for the first volume, was 142 pages of story. The, I think I I think ideally yeah. down the road we're going to try to get to more like like 60 to 80 pages in, in those books. Uh, so that, that that was the story taking over, which which is a good thing. Um, right. But uh, 
it, the size is just a, it's just a pleasant size to be able to enjoy the story, take in all the details. And, and, and it, as an artist, it's a chance to, um, to do all the stuff I want to do and have it actually print and show up and, um, and be rereadable. You know, we want this book to be not just a one time you throw it away. This is a book, you, you know, every year you pick it up or you hand it off to someone else and it can be read by multiple people and, um, um, our kids, everything, you know, it's a, it's kind of a bomb proof printing job on it with the hardcover and everything. Um, and it just, it just, uh, it looks great on the bookshelf. And, you know, it, our goal is to have like a, a bookshelf full, full of those, full of adventure man. So. Is that how long it's going to be to <laughs> take up a full bookshelf? Well, um, have you guys like talked about how yeah, long um, this, this is going to run? How many seasons we're going to get of adventure man? Um, well, it, I mean, as of today, we are looking at five books. I'm having a lot get... of trouble hearing. I don't know. Like... You're a little pixelated on my end. Um, yeah, but we're looking at uh, five books. Um, this five of uh, five book series is kind of good for everybody else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is it me? Anyway, um, let's keep going. So you're uh, looking at five books? Correct. I mean, five, the five books will get the story out. Uh, if, um, if there's an audience still hungry for it, then um, um, we'll just keep going. So, we're, we're, that, you know, volume two comes out in uh, June. So uh, we'll see, see what the reception is that. But we're going straight into volume three after that. And uh, the, the initial storyline is, is five volumes. And that launches us into a whole new direction after that, which is we're all ready to do. Um, it's just, um, we assume that's what we're going to be doing. So um, so let's kind of get back to so everyone who has not read Adventure Man. Um, Matt, what was like the initial um, pitch that you, that you said to Terry back during the days of it when you guys were doing X-Men? Still choppy on my end. Um, Terry, what was, what was the pitch? I'll tell if Matt can't talk, I'll talk, I guess. Yeah. Um, because the, the pitch the pitch was uh, yeah, uh, I'm, yeah. Should I show you? I'm there. gonna try maybe okay. shut down and tell it back. I'll be right back. All right, cool, okay. cool, cool. Um, the original pitch was a uh, was a uh, four or five page pitch that covered it was basically like eight issues, and those eight issues are gonna be the first five volumes, uh, because. Our, our first issue of Adventure Man ended up being 60 pages and it was only supposed to be 20. So we, um, the book is just, as we, each issue we produce becomes like two more issues. There's so much story that we have come up with. The, the basic plot uh, will take place over those five volumes. And that was in, in Matt's initial um, outline. All the main characters were in there. The names of the characters were in there. Matt's initial outline had was just like gold every other sentence of a, a brand new uh, name of a character or an object or a place. Um, it was it was it was so much fun to uh, read that and see how much enthusiasm he had for the uh, for the project. Um, and uh, but yeah, that 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 initial 2010 proposal had the bones of this project. Um, I think the one thing that we've really deviated from, besides adding just more material, and more stuff, more more story is the, the sisters really developed quite a bit from that initial um, storyline. The, 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 the golden age characters are pretty much right. the same, but the, the modern, the sisters really developed into a much more diverse uh, group of characters. And that was just the chance for me to um, draw anything, you know, let, let's, right. let's make this as, um, for, as an artist, as, uh, as uh, widespread and, and broad and diverse as possible. Cause I just wanted the challenge and I wanted the reader to have the opportunity to, to see all these different characters, um, right? So that, that How was many really have we, uh, uh, seen so far. We've seen like what thirty four, right? What characters? We've seen, yeah, we've seen like a bunch. We've seen. Yeah, I think. Well, um, yeah, I think we're. I think we're at our limit for a while now with the, right. the, the with the new um, this new uh, miniseries, the um, the fairy tale of New York. You know, we get more of the Western characters. Right. And that's, I think, I think we're good with those guys and those characters till the end of this, um, this big arc, this five issue arc. We won't see too many new characters out of that. Maybe a couple more older characters, but um, we've got enough characters now. 
<laughs> now, what we're really going to do is allow this, the, the, the Claire's sisters to kind of take a spotlight issue by issue. Um, Cause I think there's, we haven't, need, we really haven't just scratched the surface on those characters and those characters are really are her sidekicks. You know, we're really going to yeah. try to develop that idea. Yeah. And that, that was, that was the, the, the um, idea all along is that, you know, it's these seven sisters with Claire being the, the adventure man, the main, the main character. Right. right. So, and yeah. then of course, Tommy's there right with her, always like kind of right. geeking out and right. everything. I think Tommy's my favorite so far. I just love yeah, yeah. No, Tom, <laughs> Tommy's the fanboy. you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's got all the knowledge. That's he, right. He's the adventure man fanboy. He's the one that uh, I assume the reader can identify with because he's, yeah. he's, he's, he's the one that reads the book, knows everyone's secrets and their origins. And, uh, and obviously Claire, uh, relies on him to know right. how to solve some of these problems. And we'll see that issue by issue. I'm drawing, working on issue nine right now. And one of the other sisters uh, brings Tommy in from school. To actually Matt, help you look him. very handsome right now. Uh, uh, that doesn't look great. Hang on a minute. So, but yeah. Um, so yeah, Tommy is very involved and uh, he will stay continually involved. But we're just, we're, what we're going to really see is, is, is how the, the family itself the Connell family is the new adventure team taking the roles of the original pulp heroes. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that, that is, that is uh, kind of the joy of the series right. is, is giving all these characters that spotlight. Right. Um, it's always great kind of seeing that crossover of these characters. Um, I really like the family dynamic at, at the first, like within like the first Shabbat dinner. I remember, right. um, yeah. I remember texting you that night because um I'm Jewish and I have during like the high holidays, our extended family comes down and actually my grandfather's on the hearing aids, which okay, is a really right, present. Yes. Sometimes, sometimes he'll take them out. Right. And especially when he has a hard day, he'll take them out. So like, we've definitely right. had like those conversations of just like, of we're trying to talk to him and he's like, just like looking <laughs> and he's smiling. You're like, listen, you're like listen, I, I remember, yeah. I remember one time we tried to deliver like bad news, but like he was reading our faces Right. And he was yeah. just like, <laughs> we're trying to deliver <laughs> bad news. <laughs> oh, it, it, the, 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 deaf, the deafness with Claire is such a great, um, <clears throat> great uh, thing as an artist to uh, play with. Cause it, you know, comics is, you know, it's a silent medium really. And the, right. the chance to play, play that with, way with her and the, and the sound effects. And then uh, Matt came up with the great ideas of how she, you know, when she has the hearing aids out and, you know, her being you know, oblivious to the family because she just wants to take a break like, like your grandpa does. Uh, but yeah, the, the Claire, Claire being the Jewish character brings in the high holidays and that's really the way the family unites. So, okay. Hey, Matt's clearer. I will see. I don't know. No, Sorry, you're, you're much better. You're louder and clearer. Great. Hi. <laughs> Slightly better. Terry's right. Everything Terry said is no, no. Hey, time for the high holidays now, Matt. Talk about the Shabbat dinner. Oh yeah, great, great Shabbat. Yeah, man. Um, no. no, yeah. So then, oh, was... Brandon, Brandon, tell Matt really quickly about your grandpa. So we roll. So clear. my grandfather has hearing aids. He's not deaf. He just has trouble hearing a lot of times. So some sometimes, like during the high holidays, right when it's like um, I consider Hanukkah like Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, and it falls on a Shabbat. We have like a big dinner, right? And sometimes he'll take his <laughs> hearing aids out for it, right? So it was almost like a complete parallel so sometimes, like this one night we were trying to deliver like not so great news to him right and he took his hearing aids out he was like trying to read our lips and everything he's giving us all thumbs up and, and like he's listening and we're just trying to like deliver it wasn't anything like terrible like like no nobody died or nothing but but not thumbs up news. it wasn't like thumbs up news it was like i don't know um i don't remember what we were trying to tell him it could have been something about our favorite football team and but oh man i don't even remember no, but it's... it was um that whole family dynamic. I, really I, I don't know what's going person. on. My, uh, you, I'm sorry. This is. Oh no, we're, okay. we're doing all right. Hang on again. I'm sorry. I'm gonna give me. All right. Yeah. So, um, the high holidays, Terry. I guess it's uh, now back to you, man. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. Matt obviously. Each sister comes from a slightly different background and Claire's Jewish. And so that's obviously pretty important to her with, you know, her and her son. And so that's the, every Friday they get together for the meal and every, all the different family members bring in different food from their cultures or backgrounds. And um, uh, it's the one time since everyone's an adult and they have their own lives. It's the, 
this is a Friday night get together. Um, and it, it's the family moment. Um, so yeah, exactly. It's uh, um, uh, a celebration of the family. So mm -hmm. it's kind of fun to, to it's a great way to introduce all the characters, of course. Yeah. Um, and, and we'll be seeing it again. Yeah. Fraction again. Are we good? Does it work for everybody else but me? Does it? Because like yeah. I, everybody freezes the second I show up. I can so hear you. We can me. all hear you. Yeah, yeah, we can, yeah, we can hear we you. Can hear you and Steve. Yeah. I, you guys, I get every third syllable and lots of froze, lots of freeze frames. Is your how many people are using the Wi-Fi? Is it me? Uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and let's see maybe i do this hang on a minute um yeah no i'm plugged in like it's a hardwired connection you sound great man no i think he can't hear us though he said it's like kind of like you can't hear me. i can't i can't hear you guys at all but i can mm -hmm. i can see you if you type the questions in the private chat i could i can answer that if you guys can hear me okay. okay but i can't tell all right when anyone's talking and when anyone's not all right, let's do that. Talk about Shabbat. Boom. Sorry. Talk excited. about Shabbat. Uh, um, so some uh, 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 friends uh, who are not terribly orthodox in their Judaism uh, uh, have a daughter who was getting to a point in her life where she was kind of inquiring what it means to, to, to be a Jew and to be a celebrant of all the kind of different Jewish holidays, great and small. And one part of that for her was like a Shabbat dinner. And it became a kind of regular get together here in Portland of this kind of big uh, adopted family of all of, you know, lots of, uh, 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 I, I think maybe the, our hosts were the only Jewish people at the dinner. Maybe not, maybe that's not quite true, but it was a, it just became a lovely tradition and a chance for all of us to get together and talk about, Right. what family and stuff means to us. And it sort of felt like a great opportunity to have, since we were going to have this multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-spiritual cast, like a chance to do that. So, um, right. yeah, so that was kind of, that was the thinking there. It was also too, like, it's a great, it's such a huge cast. Every now and again, you just need to get everybody in a room and have them talk. Yeah, without figuring out who's who and where's where, and so like oh, every Friday they got to come here to this dinner, right? So it's just a nice and it's a, it's, a, it's a book about family, right? So there's that, and then talk about developing the characters, Tommy and the sisters. Oh, so much of that was me saying maybe she's an EMT, and then Terry producing all of this work, right? And these incredibly soulful drawings, yeah that I would kind of respond to. So it was a kind of almost like outside in, in some ways. And then, and Terry even would be like, oh, that's not quite her yet. Even before we knew who she was, he would just know when this, whatever, you know, the story about like, somebody asked Michelangelo, how do you carve David? And he's like, you, know, you just get rid of all the parts of Marvel that aren't David. It was like, Terry knew all the parts of the drawing that weren't, you know, Evie or whatever. So yeah, yeah. So yeah it would sort of, spitball who the characters were and i'm gonna stop right. talking now so terry will and then when it's my time to talk again put it in the private chat and i'll answer yes, yes. so yeah um, no uh matt 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 gave us gave me the characters names and some some kind of ideas of what they wanted to be and then um it was developing that out a bit more and then showing it to him and then he said basically you know let's let's, let's go ahead and like do two versions of each of these and that's he kind of picked that out of, out of all those sketches that i did these types of characters races ethnicities um, ages, et cetera. And, um, and then he came back with a pretty finalized idea of each, who each of these seven sisters were. And then I went back to the table and did one more, one more draft on it. And that was pretty close. That last sketchbook session was the, um, who ended up, who those characters really ended up being and who showed up at that table. Um, we really kind of nailed them there. And now, now obviously we get the chance to really develop them, but we kind of knew, what their purpose was, who they were, where they came from, and you know, kind of how they contributed to the family. Um, it was a really 
it was super collaborative that way that we we knew where we needed to be. Um, it was just a matter of sifting through and finding out what right. what the most important a- attributes or uh, personalities we really needed to make it a to make it a a, a fun family, a diverse family. Right, and, uh, and now it's working fine. So maybe that maybe it'll stay this way. Fingers crossed. But maybe um, it's because Terry was talking. <laughs> yes, <laughs> finally, <laughs> finally, finally, Terry's got a, a muzzle for me. Great. <laughs> it's, 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 it's ten years. It finally found it. <laughs> That's right. Um, we did we did X Men and kind of producing traditional full scripts, but when we came together to do Defenders, we wrote in what's called Marvel style um, as an experiment. But both of us ended up really liking it. Uh, but it's a much more I find it to be a much more collaborative kind of comic writing, um, and much more intuitive and much more. It, it, it's a little bit like like dancing a tango like you have to really be in tune with your partner and really paying attention um it's scary because sometimes because you know uh, you know if it's not a full script you know you, there are these kind of tool like elements of authorial control that a writer is theoretically giving up um but i i found it to be i love writing that way and i love writing that way with, especially with terry and just he'll send things back and it, it just becomes a kind of creative game of like you know, uh, this and this and this and this and this, or well, almost like that monkeys in a jar game where you're trying to like connect the monkeys. Yes, that's right. That's From right. Toy, so, I don't know why my mind went straight to Toy Story. Yeah, not, like, no, 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 uh, <laughs> but it's it's um, you know, I don't, I don't, but like this arc has like ghost gangsters in it, and it was I don't even remember g- gangsters, ghosts, ghost gangsters, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wasn't that yeah. Harry's idea? It's super collaborative. We we, yeah. we really Matt will say something, and I'll say something. It just and and either gets forgotten or merged or turned into something else. And um, like you remember, yeah. you remember it a little sideways, and it comes out. To, yeah, yeah. It's, it feels like making comics when I was a kid. It feels like the <laughs> yeah. comic books I drew instead of paying attention in school when I was plotting out thirty-five issues of whatever superhero team I had invented that day. It's very oh, wow. and, then a, and then a dinosaur who's on fire and can ride a motorcycle and explodes with karate. And, and, and a terror uh, train. I forget the terror, terror train. train. Terror train, right. I watched Terror Train <laughs> with my son. I was like, shit, we gotta put a we gotta put a seat on a train. <laughs> we have cowboys now. I mean we're we're yeah. I, I don't feel like we're just throwing stuff at the kitchen sink. I think I think yeah. we're picking things that are pretty uh, indicative of the uh the pulp era and, and yeah, that, uh, yeah, that's that's the key, is right. Like it's all well, those so divert. Like if you can view anything through that pulp lens, you can tell. You can do anything. You can tell any kind of story. You know, we're gonna do some science fiction stuff soon, uh, right? And that's that's gonna be cool, right? But it's but it all it's works fun. through that lens, right? And it's fun that we're doing this 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 um, arc now ended up being like this holiday story. You know, kind of a Christmas New York uh, snowing kind of thing. And that sounds and, familiar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, kind of like Hawkeye. Um, so it, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a chance to kind of make use, really try to use the setting and and, and stuff to tell the story, uh, even make it even more unique or whatever. So um, we and that was that was that was the Christmas thing. It was the, this arc, like I think, it started right around last Christmas when it was the first yeah. script, and it's like, oh, I'm thinking about Christmas. Let's let's do Christmas, right. You know, and, yeah. and then suddenly that opens up all this other. What does New York look like at Christmas time? And that's great. We that's totally that's a different New York than the first Dark's New York, mm-hmm. right? And right. It's kinda, the coloring changes, the the mood changes, the tone changes. It's all about ghosts. It's... Like all the best Christmas stories are ghost stories, right? So yeah. great right. ghost gang, and it all just kind of fully fuzzes together. Yeah, it's uh, our own Christmas Carol. Maybe we should change yeah, the art. Yeah. Right. <laughs> We're gonna get squibs. Maybe yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe you can uh, make your own song into the into like the book you know and that's where the or, real money is you write a christmas song huh it's for Facebook <laughs> forever you know jingle. um <laughs> a little jingle or you know if you ever decide to do the new year's thing because new york is different at new year's especially when mariah carey has another failed performance <laughs> or <laughs> um <clears throat> so what time so now you- now when the end of the storyline ends with like Tommy or Claire hanging from the ball as it's lowering. <laughs> know that that came from you and this and me no. not thinking what comes after Christmas? New Year's. 
<laughs> yeah, right. What comes after Christmas New Year's? Oh yeah, this no, video yeah. resort okay. back to this video. upside down, right? That's got to be a thing. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, clip that. Good idea. <laughs> Now, do you guys happen to be fans of Booster Gold? Um, I, I, not it's not exact, but I feel like you know sometimes it's like Claire is Booster or and uh, Tommy Skeets in the way that he's always got the answers for her. You know, it's kind of yeah. steering her in the right direction. And then more like yeah. Cal- more like Calvin and Hobbes, aren't we? Yeah, I think so. I like yeah. that. I like that. <laughs> That's a no, good one. I don't know. Somewhere between Booster and Skeets and Calvin and Hobbes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. So, um, mm. What has been like the biggest difference for both you guys, like in your career, right? Because you guys each have different experiences. Matt, you've obviously dabbled into the indie world a lot more. Terry, I know um, you've kind of done a lot of covers in the meantime. How has this book really been disti- more distinguishing in your careers um, as compared to like past projects? Well, it's the first thing I've written that I feel comfortable giving to anybody. Mm. Like even my Marvel stuff was a, was kind of PG thirteen, you know. Uh, and it's Marvel, so it's not going to be difficult mm. that tough. But like, it's not it's not necessarily appropriate for some eight or nine or ten year olds. I have some friends from those Friday dinners who have a daughter who is seven. And she, and he uh, uh, dad texted me the other day that she is the she is like adventure man obsessed, and they read it every night, and she is just Honestly. obsessed with it. And it's like it's she has her her first comic. She like, and it was like this is the first comic I could write that I give to a seven year old. Right, right, right. So that's the biggest thing for me, and that was part of by design. Is like I want to write a thing that I can just unequivocally give to anybody. Right. Being like, here you go, off the shelf, first comic, boom. Yeah, right? I so like, literally great... the worst word in it is butts. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what the butts, man? Oh, what the butts? My son, my son said that when he was when the trailer for Force Awakens came out. <laughs> I, I we, we, sat, we watched it. it, and I go, and just think, Henry, in sixteen months you'll be able to go see that movie. And he goes, sixteen months? What the? Butts and storm out of the room, <laughs> furious. Yo, <laughs> not gonna lie, I said what the butts, but that was for the end of Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> oh, right, sure, sure. <laughs> what about you, Terry? How does this kind of compare to your past work? Um, this has been uh, this is my third creator owned book. Um, but this was the one of the three that I was most involved with from the ground level, so it's so much of the story the characters and the places are things that i'm curious about or, or want to explore and or suggested uh, so I, i'm extremely involved um with i'd say every aspect of the book and the story and the look i mean there's so much um I, i've already mentioned what a big fan of new york i am and, and this book has come kind of a love letter to new york um and then it's a, a chance to embrace um uh the art of the thirties and forties artists that I like, and then um, a chance to uh, play around with the, uh, you know, modern, modern uh, mythos. And then, and obviously diversity. I mean, that's, that was such a big deal for me to be able to draw a book that had such a wide range of characters, uh, uh, backgrounds, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> I really wanted to, um, I don't know, draw a book that uh, I was interested in. I hope that more people of uh, all, all types of people would be interested as well. You know, I wasn't trying to trying to make it broad on purpose. It's just well, that uh, I just felt like there's so many things that um, um, I wanted to draw that I wasn't being given the opportunity to draw. And, um, and it sure makes it a lot easier to draw seven sisters if they're all uniquely individual looking characters as opposed to <laughs> true siblings. Right. I was. I will admit, as an artist, there was there was a, a bit of an out with that. But I tell you what, I, I so much more enjoy. And since I colored the book myself, um, right. it's really important. It's it's a lot more fun to play with all those different palettes and and colors and shapes. Um, so it's 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 a chance to kind of draw a lot of stuff that I maybe touched on. But this is a chance to, like was able to throw all those things into one place. And um, and 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 Matt always gives me something a twist on what I thought I was going to do anyways and pushes me a little bit more 
um, which, uh, you know, as an artist to be pushed and to be challenged, you know, what's going to happen at the end is you're just going to end up with a better story or better art uh, and, and, right. and grow as an artist. Um, so, uh, I'm, you know, I'm super pleased with, where, where, with what's come out and then where we're going to go still. We're still just kind of scratching the surface on a lot of these ideas. And, you know, it, it, part of the joys of making an original comic is you get to pick your partner. Right. You know, so there's no Adventure Man without Terry. It's not like I had the idea and was just looking for somebody to draw it. Like I, right. I in all the original stuff I do, I try to write for someone. Dozens of books that aren't going to happen because my collaborators couldn't do it. Right. And like, I'm not going to change this for somebody else. I thought of Terry for writing. When I wrote this, I can't imagine it for anybody else but Terry. So it's like, it's yeah. a... It's a I, yeah, I don't. I don't have a pile of ideas that I just go around. Looking, right. You know what I mean? It's sort of like, what can I write for you, as somebody who loves comics? How? What do I think the ultimate Terry Dodson comic would be? How do I write into that? Probably something I, with Emma Frost. But no. <laughs> we had done that. We did that. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Put it to bed. Because when I, I like I said, I was recently reading X Men, and actually Steph was the one who was really like pushing me to read it for like a lo the longest time. Now I was like, you know what? I guess now that I've actually found these hardcovers, makes it a, a good opportunity. I was like, yeah, all of these characters in here, like Emma Frost, um, even Psylocke at times, I'm like, these are all uniquely Terry characters. <laughs> so but I really now, um, it. got a question about like, were was it the original Adventure Man's team based off like the archetypes, like pulp heroes of the past? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, it's like, and like, how do you take the stuff that's undeniably cool about those archetypes and get rid of the stuff that is undeniably not cool about that? Right. Yeah. Right. How do you strip it of the racism and colonialism and imperialism and jingoism and all the other stuff that makes you watch the stuff now? Like, <laughs> uh, how do I <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How do you, how do you decringe it? Right. How do you make it? Yeah. So how can we, invest modern sensibilities into all the stuff that like it's great it's cool it's amazing but let's figure out a way to do it that isn't just i don't know you know all that, all that stuff. No, no, no. it makes it hard to read and enjoy these days yeah. right yeah. right and terry how did you go about designing all of these different costumes are they going to change are they, now that we're going to be more in the world of adventure man or are they going to like stay the same because also like i do want to talk about the cost of magic as well for every time Claire goes into Adventure Man, she comes back, her physique is different, appetite is different. But first, um, talk about the designs a little bit for each of the sisters and, and the, the look of the world, essentially. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was Herculean, the, the effort in order to design this book. I mean, this, this proposal came up in 2010, and, and it, we were, I'm designing essentially, on the surface, I'm designing two separate universes with all these characters a 1940s pulp universe and then a modern new york universe but we even have plans to take this story to like a, a like a, a third like a tertiary kind of a level of, of but that's down the road and so i'm when i'm designing both those worlds i'm, I'm thinking even long term so it's not like it, it it was a lot of effort it was a lot of it was it's literally years of uh sketchbook time um figuring that out i mean i i started off with both uh, adventure man you know figuring out who he was and i was figuring out who claire was and once i kind of got those guys figured out then i was able to move into all the um uh the side characters um i came up with multiple versions of all the um the, the pulp heroes and villains and, and the same thing with with claire and her family and but once i kind of like got the main characters the main looks of those guys figured out it was a little bit easier to to really go and, and invest into the um into all the uh, all the other uh, pulp characters and the other modern characters, but um, there are so many iterations over so many years. I think the first real adventure, adventure man started emerging like in 2015 or so. That actual mm. character and Claire around the same time, and then um, just figuring out the little tiny details that, that made them unique. And, uh, and, and even on the page, I'm still able to do that. And I find this uh, continuing problem not problem. It's a good problem to have, but with Claire is that she's six six. And so where is she buying her clothes? And so as we're drawing those issues, I'm thinking, hold on, this just happened to her. What in that household can she actually wear today in the cold that will fit her and right. be practical to go run around it? And, but still needs to look um, 
toyable, you know, you got to be able to see that outfit and know that she can wear it and they can make a toy out of it. If they had to, you know, it has some kind of a, a definitive look to it. And for me, finding something like, like stripes, like an athletic stripe has been kind of like a, a, a touchstone to kind of come back to with her to give her a definitive look. I also do things it like, like she's uh, like wearing knickerbockers, right? So like capri pants and tall socks. Capri like pants, it's, yes. He's meeting, that's he's meeting exactly. both way. I'm going down as yeah. far as I can and up as high as I can. And <laughs> exactly. She looks like a football player in the twenties. Yeah. And, and, and trying to give each character like uh, colors. That's yeah. like a, a thing. Like you know, you, when you design stuff, design characters, you go for silhouettes and stuff. But I, I, I I've been leaning heavily into uh, color themes for each one of those characters. So, even if you're not positive who that is, at least you should feel like that character because you're that, that you know like that color instinct is kicking in. Um, and that, you know, and that, was, that, was, that was from this is one of my favorite. This is like grab a popcorn, in, everyone. This is where it gets interesting. <laughs> yeah, but like in the there's a, I have it in my notebook, so Yo. it's so many characters, and so I can keep track of them all. I printed these pages out though, but like you were like, okay, so if there were planets for each of the sisters, who would they be? And like like these kind of levels of thought, they're like, oh, oh, but it worked. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. right. And, and the, the, that, that, yeah, that, that color coding was, was huge. Now, <laughs> now um, here's an interesting question. I always like to ask indie writers this. If they had a favorite superhero, who would it be? Like if the character, and I think that's a pretty cool question. Um, Let's see if you guys get the same answer. Wait, you want me to guess his, or you want me to guess mine? No, no, um, like, like um, who would Claire's be? Who would Claire's favorite oh. superhero be? Or Tommy. Well, Tommy's would be Adventure Man. Yeah. <laughs> now Adventure Mom. Uh, or Claire. Adventure Man. Claire's would be... Um... Now, does, think... Miss, does Miss Marple count as a superhero? Miss Marvel? Um, Marple. Uh, Marple? The, the, oh, the, the, yeah. yeah. Yeah, detective. Yeah. Yeah. Lady yeah. Sleuth. I don't know. The question, the way the Renee Montoya question. I was, I was like, leaning more towards like spoiler and like how like her sense of like adventure, like her, her like, because spoilers always chasing somebody down, always like um, being there for everybody. I was thinking more spoiler. Maybe. Um, or more Kitty Pride, but you know, that, that could be a good one too. I mean, she's 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 a Wonder Woman in a way. I mean, that's she's this you know tall, striking, powerful uh, woman. Um, so I mean, she's a part Wonder Woman, but that's that's very broad and vague on that. But I mean, I feel that uh, just because that's the ability that she's kind of has and will kind of lead lead her family, whatever. Um, but she, but you know, she's a she's a street level uh, cop. That was her day job. And uh, so, yeah, Matt's ideas are actually a little bit closer, I think. Although I like, although I like Kitty Pride. I mean, uh, 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 Jewish, and as we've seen, she kind of Claire kind of has that uh, the sort Claire. of to turn invisible. You know, mm -hmm. she wants to disappear sometimes. Like there might be something that I think if somebody had given her an event, uh, an X Men comic at the right time in her life, she would have just been into into the Kitty Pride stories. You know. Yeah. Definitely right. not when her wedding got ruined and it turned into the gamut and rogue, <laughs> which was a great series. It was a great Terry did the covers that that was a lot of fun. Yes. For the Mr. and Mrs. X. Um, so how will you guys talk about the cost of magic a little bit, right? Cause every time that they go into this world, there is a ramification about that, which is really interesting. Yeah. Um, I think I don't want to spoil stuff, so mm -hmm. it's definitely a thing. There, there, there's it's a it's a I don't know I don't know how to talk about it without talking about parts of the book. I don't think I'm ready to talk about. Okay, but no worries. Sort of the 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 effect of like magic and memory are kind of the two. Right. Like, as a writer, how do you go about evaluating what can change about a person? Or what should change when they go in and out of that world? Maybe that's a better question. Oh, no, that's just, that's just manipulative. <laughs> what do I need for the story? Oh, I think I'm... if she was taller or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, oh, oh please, I, I, don't, I don't, yeah, no, it's, it's all story. That's all just kind of story-driven stuff. But, but as long as it 
folds into those kind of themes and I'm not right. ready. Right. You know what I mean? Like it's a, it's a, it's all character driven or plot driven. And then I, then I figure out how to fit it into the, the framework. Something, and you know, something that um, when Matt and I were talking about where we want this book to be, I said, I told Matt, I go, I, f- I feel like the world, the kind, the kind of world this book would take place in would be something like that Hellboy takes place in or Indiana Jones takes place in it. It's a world where yeah. magic's possible. Any, anything can kind of happen. It, you know, the, even in Indiana Jones, you have aliens and you have, you know, the biblical s- stuff. Um, I, I like the idea that um, there could be ghosts. Um right. Uh, so the ground, you know, what, what were the rules? And I, I felt like th- those kind, of, those two books were kind of like a good um, place to kind of to set ourselves and and um, not not story wise, but just like yeah, the, it's an the, elevated. Yeah, people. If people see ghosts, their their concerns are going to be let's get away from those ghosts and not wait a second. Ghosts are real, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. It's yeah. not that kind of thing. You know? Right. Oh, the thing that occurred to me too to kind of skip back for a second, that just to kind of, you know, there, there's a there's a thing, there's a, a writers uh, that writers will throw out at like network executives and television where they're trying to impress them and say like that the 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 setting is a character, the city is a character, or whatever. It's really true in in this book because it's easy for me to say it's New York, but it's New York remembering what it wanted to look like once upon a time, right. That's about as much writing I can as I can do on the city as a character, right? And it's up to Terry to like down to the 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 the, the design of the, the, the street lamps, right? And how, what's the difference between a modern? What does the old world street lamp look like, and then what does the adventure world street lamp look like? And like that kind, of, like it's easy for me to say, but right. then t- Terry has to figure it out. So like it's, it's like the 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 it really is true how it's it's the, the city is the character in the book that Terry writes, you know, like, cause I can go, hey, it's New York and it's winter. And no, maybe the old, maybe the street lamps look different. And all right, well, if the street, and it's Terry who has to do all of this kind of creative work and it makes the world so incredibly rich. So well. yeah, great to right into it, you know? but, yeah. Yeah. So Terry, how yeah. about those street lamps? Like what was your approach going into them? <laughs> Which one? No, <laughs> I don't mean, know. He's been to New York. You kind of know that there's, you know, all these yeah. different types of street lamps that have been there for either they're the brand new, they've been there forever. Or the cool thing that we we see happening in issue uh, issue six or seven is that we're seeing New York is changing before the the um, the residents' eyes. Um, it's like people are walking down the street and going, is that what that sign looked like? That I don't remember that sign exactly being like that. So what we're seeing is is kind of like the adventure world of the 40s and, and Claire's modern world are kind of, there's this little thing happening where the worlds are crossing over. Um, so even those lamps that you're seeing are changing. So it, I advise all readers to really pay attention to things in the background because yeah. everything is not. Because exactly. Lord knows Terry does. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Pay attention. Put the time into it. There's, so yeah, there's a website called Forgotten New York, and yeah. it's full of things like, "Hey, did you know this is what street signs used to look like?" And there are four of them left in the in Manhattan, and here's where you can find them, or here's where the last phone booth in the Bronx is. Here's where you can find uh, like it's full of stuff, and then you you'll see these things. You're like. This is this, you'll see some part of a building that's been there for eighty years and you've never noticed it, and then suddenly it's like, oh look, like the, the the ceiling of Grand Central Station was so filthy, they had no idea there were constellations painted on it because it had been so long, and it was, and then they were doing a restoration and a cleaning, and there was this entire painted, right. beautiful kind of turquoise and gold ceiling that everyone had just forgotten about. Or maybe and it was like just covered with filth. There's like a lot of graffiti or something. Yeah, that. but like it's just that kind of thing of like there's all this beauty that if you see it every day, it just becomes mundane. Right, you know? right. right, right. And yeah, it's, I think it's embracing those, um, embracing what's already there, expanding upon it, merging it with the modern, uh, cre- creating like this, this, this new uh, a third you know this third version of 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 this thing, this right. this new type of architecture, this new type of uh adventure world i think right and that's really interesting because like um so my family grew is from pittsburgh pennsylvania so um 
growing I grew up here, so always like when I see old pictures of Pittsburgh, right? Obviously, like a you if anyone remembers that one like picture during the Pirates World Series, all those guys at the top of the building looking into the stadium, that's actually my grandfather in the picture. Oh wow. So it's like every time I see like that outlook at the stadium whenever they do like the skyline. But now when I go back there, right, because uh, my parents have a house there. Um, it's always weird seeing like how everything changed or like even like a, even a restaurant, right. That goes out of business. Like one of the famous hot dog places just went out of business and it's been there since like what, like 1970 It's like weird, man, you know? So well, it's it crazy like, seeing the way cities change. Big and too, like Rust Belt cities, like Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Detroit, like those are profound differences. Yeah. Yeah. Like Absolutely. those are, and you can go to like even like Columbus today. You can see when like Columbus was. Lovely. I don't know. It's weird to see the kind of majesty in small places. You right. See. Yeah. Right. Um, is there anything left about Adventure Man before we uh, kind of move on? Talk about some X Men. Talk about obviously um, Hawkeye and all, and all that other fun. So is there anything else about adventure that you guys want to announce anything you guys want to um, share coming up? Yeah, this is actually really exciting. Um, every issue, every actual physical single comic is an NFT. You invest heavily, invest wisely. <laughs> it's the only one that exists that is exactly like that one. And once you own it, it's yours forever. <laughs> Invest seriously. It's only Sales just quadrupled. Mm-hmm. Well, not only a uh, masterful work on both your ends, it's an NFT at the same time. It's always been an NFT. Oh, We're ahead oh. of the game. Yeah, slab yeah. it. Oh. Slab that NFT. Get it. Send it to CGC. Get a 9-8. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, well, issue eight, issue 8 came out last week. Issue 9 will be out in, in April, I think. It, issue 8 has my favorite flashback. Favorite, probably favorite cover and uh, uh, favorite... Yeah, favorite yeah. favorite flashback to date. It's a great little, and I, it was it. I it, um, I did a, a, a Jimmy Olsen series last year with Steve Lieber, nice. and we did yes. some stuff when Jimmy was a kid, and Steve drew like little kid comics, and it was delightful. And I was like, what would it be like if Terry did that? So like, I was like, I had to figure out a kid flashback to see what, and and oh my god, it's just the best cover and my favorite little bit of business. It's just a, a terrific little thing. So yeah, it's I'm high yeah. Now. Yeah, fun. that Jimmy Olsen run is so much fun. Thanks. That was a really fun book. I also... nine, uh, uh, thank you. I cut you off. I'm sorry. Oh, no. I was saying <laughs> that and Lois Lane were also like hand in hand. I really enjoyed both of those. You had like a really gritty story. Then you had like just a fun thank little you. heartwarming story going on the other one. So um, how was Hawkeye, Matt? Uh, in what way? How was, uh, how was the, the both? The, the Let's start with the book. How was the comic? How was it? Yeah, like writing it. Was it fun? No. Um, <laughs> it was something. It was great. It was crazy. It was unbelievable. It was every... It was uh, the opposite of everything everybody said it was going to be and remained that way until it became a Disney Christmas TV show. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I was I was yeah. in LA for the premiere and wished that David or Annie could have been with me um, because our stuff were on billboards and buses and uh, Bill. Po- you know what I mean? Like like it was all over the place. It was crazy. It was crazy. They shut down Hollywood Boulevard and with the red carpet and purple targets and Christmas trees and fake snow and, and the dog and all of it, man. It was, it was nuts. It was crazy. It was absolutely crazy and, and incredibly gratifying. And um, yeah. And, and it defied, I, it defied and continues to defy expectation, which delights me. Right. Um, I remember we reviewed it for our archive show. We reviewed the first volume uh, about a month before the show. And we had like people like hitting us up on the side, like why Hawkeye, why Hawkeye? Like, why is this the thing? I was like, because this is the best book of the year ever going to read. <laughs> and, then they, <laughs> and then people were like asking, like, okay, is it going to rival like Paper Girls? Is it going to rival Saga? Is it going to, is it like this book? I was like, no, it's just better than all of it. <laughs> Suck it, Brian K. Vaughn. <laughs> yeah. 
Ooh. So it was funny because you were talking about writing books for children. And I remember specifically at a Brian K. Vaughn panel, he's like, yeah, my Runaways book ruined my kid. And I was like, that's like when my head like perked up. because it was like on a Sunday when like <laughs> everyone was like really tired from the con. And it was, um, he was like, yeah. So in like the third issue, it, I said that Santa Claus wasn't real. And I didn't realize giving it to my eight-year-old son, he came running to me saying, dad, Santa Claus isn't real. And it was, it was like the funniest moment of that panel. I really appreciated that moment. Um, but when you was was Hawkeye a book that you wanted to pitch originally, or was it like here you go, Matt? Or we wanted to uh, do a Hawkeye comic book at some point when we were doing Iron Fist? I'd said that the like if we were smart, we would you know do Wolverine or something. Now and he was like, yeah, but I'm not smart. My favorite guy's always been <laughs> Hawkeye, and I was like, yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, so we just shared a love of the character, and then when. The Avengers movie came out. They were thinking, hey, all these characters should probably have books. And they were trying to show me the door. <laughs> and uh, so I got a Hawkeye book and, and we got to do it with David. But like it, it, it immediately exploded and just changed everything. Right. So, yeah, so yeah, like, I never, wanted to do it. I wanted to do it for David and with David. But yeah. didn't think it was going to go beyond five issues. Right. Wow. Yeah, it's a great artist to work with. Um, now, uh, you're more Iron Fist run, Matt. Um, have you did you like like the pulp world? I noticed that there is like some pulpness going on with that, with like Orson Randall and the pulp Iron Fist, who dope by the way, great creation. Ed Brubaker. Are you? Oh, was that Ed's? Me. I mean, oh, it was yeah. me and Ed, but like you know. Okay. I, I, I and and, and the beat. I would feel wrong taking sole credit. Oh, actually. Now, um, did was Mortal Iron Fist kind of like a precursor to? Did you were there was there inspir like similarities or inspiration you took from Mortal Iron Fist or how? Because he, he was such a like a yeah. Well, the, character. The, yeah, the character um was like a re like a it was a, there's a Golden Age character called Amazing Man. Right. I think it was Amazing Man. Which is where John Aman's name came from. That was the joke. Right. He was John Aman. Um, <laughs> um, Bill Everett did, and that kind of fed into what Iron Fist was. I think is that I'm kind of. It's been a long time, and I've had two kids, and there's not a lot of sleep. So yeah, I yeah, and, and remembering Bronze Age comics is. But, but like it's it's sort of. But I think that was kind of the. It was the inspiration for the original Iron Fist, and then as then as Ed had the idea for there was an Iron Fist before. Danny and where would it go and where would it be and like oh well let's just go back to the golden age and let's figure out how the how the pulp heroes fed into the golden age heroes of super and the superheroes fed into the silver to the bronze it just kind of became a way of linking those legacies you know and, right um, and I think that I don't know that that necessarily led to Adventure Man but it certainly got me thinking about the world, how to reinterpret the pulp world in the modern world. Right. Okay. Right. Um, so, you know, it, would have been, it would have been around the time that I was working with Terry, so I think right. all of that stuff was kind of percolating. Right. Speaking of working with Terry, um, how how did you guys sort of build your relationship when you guys were writing Uncanny? Because I know that book especially has a huge editorial office, you're pressed for deadlines. How did you guys manage to like balance everything while still cohesively telling a story with all the other X books out there? Boy, I don't know that I would say that we did, but okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or at least, Romano, Terry, if you, if you wanted to speak on that a little well, bit. Well, you know, you know what's, what was funny about that book is that I think, I believe I, re I was going to work with Ed and Greg Land was going to work with Matt. And that happened on issue 500. And then I'm 95% I'm sure Ed said, Matt's doing a great job. Let's just let him write the book. And so... Then I was working with uh, Matt, starting with his his second arc. He done the first arc with with Greg, and then I I was going to do the next one with Ed, because that's how we we're going to make sure the book was out and, and quality and all that stuff, which was awesome uh, idea wise. And uh, but Matt ended up uh, taking over the book completely, and um, our first um, our first arc was like an adventure team with a Godzilla kind of villain, and yeah, yeah. Um, Matt Matt, Matt threw out so many. Of 
ideas in that in that arc. It was like, oh, this is awesome. I had no idea. I, I, you know, Matt was still relatively new at the time. I mean, I knew Ed's track record a little bit better, um, but Matt's enthusiasm and just random ideas. You know, we had we had the Russian mob. We had Russian prison tattoos in my first arc. I mean, yeah. there was so much just out of the blue goofiness and uh, coolness, and then and he knew. He knew the characters. He knew the X-Men well enough to give me... I mean, at that point, I'd worked in the X-Men office off and on for like a, a well over a decade. So I knew the characters. I mean, you, you grow up with them, but I'd, I'd right. worked professionally with them for well over a decade. Um, so Matt Matt was just finding places to go um, that, you know, no one had done. Or, or maybe it was echoes of old things, but um, uh, the very, the, from the very first right. arc... Like we the Goblin Queen. Blast. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. Um, who would you guys say were like more of like your, your favorite characters to kind of work with? Because I know like a lot of times, especially in today's X-Men, a lot of like not really newer characters, but more niche characters like Pixie. I would even say Betsy Braddock at the time was pretty niche, you know, coming back or Madeline Pryor. Um, I mean, I mean, Pixie guys- for sure. I mean, I, I, I wanted Pixie to be my Kitty Pride. I mean, she was my teen girl yeah. Yeah. newbie on the team through who we were going to view the you know what i mean so like i i, I pixie for sure was was a, was a, a delight to write you know um, Very, any, anytime you can have a like a kid who like a teen who um is playing at not having any fucks to give right. but in fact gives all of the fucks <laughs> is great because she can poke <laughs> needles and all the balloons that need right. poking and right. then feel everything at 11 so it's just right. a great like it's a great right. flavor for for an introduction to the kind of world now was it well was it like a little bit almost like weird writing emma frost kind of as the leader of the team at first you know before she kind of turned during utopia no, I love and all like no no i i, because... I, I, I love them i'm building off of like all the amazing work that grant right. had done when they were writing mm-hmm. I think they recalibrated Emma for the 21st century and broke up the endless Scott, Jean, Scott, Jean, Maddie, and making it Scott, Jean, Emma was so much more interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. The triangle. Yeah. It was just, yeah, exactly. Because it was right, it was right. an actual triangle. And it wasn't just right. sort of like a line with a, another line. <laughs> Right. right. Would right, you right. say you prefer the, the Scott Emma relationship to the Scott Gene? Oh yeah. yeah. As a that? writer, sure. As a writer, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but but too, it was it was a, but like Emma was a character that I knew Terry was going to draw right. Yes. And not draw her as like a sex symbol. No, uh, not, I mean not even that, but like just like like there would the playful. I I think if you were to just look at any kind of random piece of Emma dialogue, no matter who wrote it, it'd be easy to think, oh, like a really mean, angry woman said sure. this, and I never heard her like that. I I always heard it as a playful meanness, you know, and that there was a te- like teasing. Right. And and it was it was always somebody making the jokes that aren't really jokes. It can't be, you know what I mean? Like and just and just Terry drew her with like a little bit of a wink. So you knew she like it was never oh, she's just awful. Right. You right. Know, she's just yeah. a mean person. Why are why is she around? She's a bummer. I don't want to hang around with them, you know, but like but because that was a like, great kind of thing about writing for Terry that early is just sort of seeing I always talk about like Disney animators. Uh, like Terry's work reminds me of the kind of that that golden age uh, that that was the Twelve Old Men or whatever of Disney. Like Terry's like pencil work and character work is so has such a, a, an internal life uh, uh, to them uh, uh, that very time. It's see, oh look how he's like you, you could make Colossus look sad. How do you make Colossus look sad? Right. The the large tiny tears of BBs come pouring on the night. Oh. I guess like, I don't know. I just, yeah. I just, uh, there was a early in the early going in that time with with, with Terry was seeing how 
Right. Look at that. Look at that. Okay, great. He, he's, he's exactly, he, he's giving everybody these, this internal life. You know? Right. Yeah. And yeah, Terry, that, that's kind of an interesting concept. You know, how did you go about um, drawing like a lot of the emotional reactions of the X-Men during this time? You know, because they had a... You know, Terry, I put everybody on an island. I, that's two books with giant casts you've had to draw from me. I'm yeah, sorry. why? Why do you put up with yeah. this guy? I don't know. I, yeah, uh, it is what it is. You, as a professional uh, artist, you learn to uh, uh, focus the reader's attention on certain things. So you don't have to draw everything. You should, you draw everything once, and then you you trick the reader into thinking that they're uh, seeing everything. And uh, and and that's that's a, that's a good trick. But uh, right. as far as like emotion and and that stuff, I, it really helped uh, on this project on the X Men that I I knew the characters really well. Uh, and then Matt, Matt gave me the um, the room to play with them, and uh, great, you know the, the the dialogue was there, and everything was set up pretty well. And, it, and it's w what I do well with pretty much anything I draw is uh, emotions. I mean, that's I get. I think I have a career as long as I do because when a, a lot of writers want to work with me because a lot of writers want to write emotions. <laughs> and right. then, you know, you need to have an artist that can actually draw those. Um, yes. So it. This is interesting. I was talking to another writer about how difficult, how rare a comic artist who can draw subtle face acting. Right, yes. Comics, everybody kind of has a, like this. Like the standard like, Jack Kirby face. No hate to Jack Kirby, but like everyone has yeah. like the same. Everybody's yelling all the time. Yeah. Like, there's no, It's one in ten, right? Like there's no, like that kind of and Terry's got that, that it's just a beautiful gift of like, oh, you really do acting. Yeah, right. gesture and faces and like, it's not all open clothes. It's not all, you know, but like you can- Very John Byrne-esque. I can write, I can write that, hey, she, she says something and she's kidding, she's teasing and it's gonna look like someone's teasing. How do you draw that? Draw teasing, but, like, <laughs> but Terry can do it. You know what I mean? And, and it's like how difficult a, right. a gift that is how rare how, how how difficult thing that is how rare a gift that is especially in comics. You know, like, like i think of terry think of like jaime hernandez i think of, right it's you, know, you have to um you have to uh you have to identify as the artist you really have to identify with the characters you have you have to give them an inner life you know the script's there but you 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 need to create something and and, and uh, design something that you identify with you know, you don't want to, and you don't want to do the same characters all the time, but you definitely you got to believe in what you're drawing, and and it's the subtleties of those things. It's it because as I've said this a lot, the comic you know comics are just lines on paper. There's no there's no movement, there's no noise, there's no um, flashing screens to draw your attention in. So right. it is subtle little things that you add into the background that make things Absolutely. look like a real right. place. Um, and 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 by uh, when you when you're drawing those characters i mean they have got to emote uh, and it's got to be subtle or it's got to be strong but you you really got to draw the, the the reader's eye and and it's little details you can do it's hand gestures it's it's poses it's finding the right distance with the camera to show the um what you need to focus on and you know it bouncing the camera around zooming in zooming out it's all that kind of stuff because i can't control everything but i can control the shot you know, panel by panel, pace by pace, page by page. There's a little subtle things that I can control. And um, um, th that's how, as the artist, you're able to show off those emotions and show off those subtleties. Um, right. So, um, it, it's, it's, the, it's the job of the, of the storyteller, of the comic storyteller to, to, to do those things. And another thing to do is, is just to simplify. You know, it, you right. draw a lot of detailed stuff, but you really need to break things down to the simplest shapes and forms and, Focus right. the reader's eye into one spot, and and as a as an artist, there's so many things you can do to, to so many tricks you can do to do that with. So right. Know that know the tools that are available. Know your limitations in this medium, and um, and and really strike hard on those things that you know work, <laughs> because yeah. you can really you can really really hit the story point home uh, when you can focus the reader in. And that's our job is is just simply that to just guide you right. along on this piece of paper. What. Well, one hundred percent. So you are talking topic. about. Oh, go ahead, Steph. Go ahead. I've been talking about random, lot. but you had me thinking. Uh, is Pride Wisdom one of your first X works? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, that would have been maybe my. I, I don't know. Maybe in the second year or so that I was working on the okay. on in the X office. Um, 
It was cool. I did. I worked with Warren Ellis on his very first comic, which was uh, Excalibur. It worked on his no first way. issue, and then and then uh, like maybe a year or so later, he did the the, the Pride and Wisdom stuff that was a miniseries that came out of the Excalibur book. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was it was actually. I mean, I, I don't know how it reads now, but uh, it was brutal. <laughs> we the scripts were like weeks late, and that would enable me to, uh, two weeks or so to draw a book, which was not ideal in the slightest but um, a lot of red I, bull a lot of a lot of monster red bull well monster. you know as, as, as in 1997 that was before red bull. we had to rely on things yeah like that, that was just coca-cola you know <laughs> <laughs> I, I was in a studio with um a number of other professionals in it and i really relied hard on those guys to help me out which is a rare time where i've actually brought in other artists that mm-hmm. we just had to get the book done and marvel yeah. was like great <laughs> <laughs> this is one of ten thousand books we're doing this month. Let's just get it done. Uh, so, two weeks. Uh, as long as it's yeah. done, it's yeah. crazy. It was crazy. I mean, it 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 was not ideal. I, yeah, like I said, I don't know how it read. It'd have been nice to have had a little bit more time because I think the story took place in London, and so there's so many fun things that I could have really played with, um, right? That I didn't wasn't able right. to. Um, so um, yeah. we always ask this question because we're all huge X Men fans here. Uh, this is this is Chet. He has he's a huge X Men fan. He has almost every X Men issue from the Claremont Burn run signed by Stan and Claremont. So that's pretty wow. dope. Um, who are your favorite X Men characters? We always got to ask, and there is a correct answer, at least in my mind. There's one wrong answer, but everything else can be correct. Favorite, Matt? Favorite. Are you going or are you sleeping there? I'm. 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 I mean. <laughs> I feel like writing X-Men made me realize I was a better X-Men reader than an X-Men writer. And it's hard to separate though, who I like writing the most from who I like reading the most. Cause I don't know that that's the same thing. So I was trying to kind of pick that apart, but like, I really enjoyed writing Emma. I really enjoyed writing Dr. Nemesis who I was kind of a blank slate. So I just kind of got to make him up, right. you know? but like, um, um, I like writing the X Club. I like writing our stuff, was like the kind of old guys off having the weird adventure. Um, I liked writing Magneto. Yes. Um, I liked writing Scott sometimes. Um, yes. um, Go Cyclops. No, Havoc. <laughs> as, as, he, as he sort of, you know, as that, that storyline kind of built, I liked writing him learning how to kind of be like a leader of people. Not right. just the team, you know what I mean? Like that was cool watching him kind of become a politician or whatever. Right. I don't know, Terry. How about you? It's, you know, like, can you honestly, separate who you like to read from who you like to draw? Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> it's almost like I've read them. I have to have to say it's, it's that's always down like to the creators. I think who I like to read, who's who's writing it. But for drawing, you know, the X Men are a family. I mean, it's a right. giant family, and so. It's it's not really this a specific X Men. It's not it's not necessarily it's Emma or, or Nightcrawler. I'll just name all my favorites. But, uh, oh, Nightcrawler, Pride, Nightcrawler, Colossus, Magneto, yeah, Wolverine. Yeah. Um, I was thinking Nightcrawler. Swarm. Um, but it's when you throw those characters together, then you throw one or two in that you didn't know or brand new. That that's what's really cool. And then uh, as an artist, I, I like to find those new characters and embrace those new characters and make those characters my favorite. Um, so I wasn't a giant Emma Frost fan. But then once I started drawing Emma, she became one of my favorites. You know, it, that's yeah. the thing is is make whatever you're doing your favorite thing because it'll show in the work. Uh, yeah. You embrace that character, you learn that character, and, and all of a sudden, I really love these characters because that's what I'm doing, and and, and the reflection in in the in the comics. Uh, this so is yes, the X Men are great. This is a perfect illustration of what I mean. Like that I was a better reader than writer of that book, but like I love Storm, and I finally was writing X Men, and I it took me eight or nine issues to figure out storm. Right. Right. And it wasn't like, she, like, I don't believe she had shown up uh, until right. she did. And when she showed up, she showed up when I finally knew what she was going to say, but it was like, I couldn't believe it. It was like having the Mike trout of the X-Men, but I'm just going <laughs> to keep her on the bench. Like, just stay there. Hang on, hang on. We're waiting for the eighth inning. But I guess oh. I, I was like, Oh shit. I don't, I don't know what to do. You know what I mean? So it was, yeah. it was a, it was a, I don't really do, I don't, yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, I, don't, I never, I don't really feel like I wrote X-Men. You know what I mean? Right. Um, Steph, who would you say your favorite is? 
Well, uh, Wolverine, easy answer. I think, you know, that's he's a classic. Uh, I like Havoc. Um, Phantom X. I was a big fan of Pixie when, you know, uh, during you guys' tenure. I think she was a yeah. great teenage archetype, okay. you know, the Jubilee, the Kitties. Not only does she look cool, she's got a cool power set. Um, let me give one more person. Uh, I'm not the biggest like, that was for you. <laughs> yeah, right. Brandon. I'm a I like I'm a bigger Havoc Polaris fan. I also like Nightcrawler, so it would probably be my big three. Um Nightcrawler Nightcrawler's always fun to draw. I mean, it's always yeah. fun to it's not a character that I would think about, but once he, he's such a uh, he's such a unique look and such a playful character he's, um that anytime he shows up, it's like, oh, this is so cool. I can kind of just do something completely completely new. But that's that's the X-Men. He, each there's such a wide range of characters in that right. book, and books and, and powers and personalities and stories. It's like, it, it's hard to get tired of drawing those guys. Right. And, and just and, one last question to, um, to wrap us up. Uh, Cause I know we are hitting that like one hour, 20 minute mark is, do you guys have any advice for any future X-Men or not X-Men or any writers, artists who X -Men are X writers run, run, run away. No, what? <laughs> I'm sorry. Read the book, no, any, any future, like people wanting to <laughs> get into, into the, um, into the the hobby or to per make this a profession. I did not articulate that well. Anyone who wants to be a writer or artist in the future, do you have any advice for them? Terry, you want to go first? No, yeah, sure. you gotta, Terry, go. Yeah, go for it. Sure. Uh, I think if you want to be an artist, I'm, the, the, I have some really simple things, but it's like draw, draw every day, draw stuff you don't like, draw the real world. I mean, that's like the boring advice that I got when I used to show my portfolio. And then I went to college and I took life drawing classes. And within two years, I was drawing comics professionally. So I can only say that it worked for me. And I continually still do that. You know, I'm, it's been 25 years into my career. I'm still uh, observing and learning more from the real world than I am from comic books. Now, embrace comics, embrace animation, embrace uh, video games, embrace movies, embrace you know, the real world, go to museums, travel, etc. cetera. Um, but man... There's so much amazing stuff in the real world. And, and, and as an artist, your job is to look at something and put it down on paper. And the best way to do that is look at real things. And pretty soon you're going to find out that you understand volume, perspective, light, and how unique um, our world is and how fantastical it is. And you take the most random things from our real world and you inject it back into a comic book. And all of a sudden, it's you put a little bit of a spin, a little bit of different color on it. And... Uh, there's a believability to it because it was based on a real thing, but um, it it, uh, it just get, it gives that depth and life to your work that it's hard to uh, to get from just learning from drawing comic books. But then, you know, what? there are people that do that, and you know, more power to them. I, I just can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and and Matt to close us out. Um, write them notebooks. For writers are like sketchbooks for artists. It's, it's where you go to suck. Like no one has to see your notebooks, but like learn how to write comic scripts, look at the comics that you love and figure out how to write it. Uh, and then write your own, find an artist that's starting out and wants to do comics and write for someone, learn what it's like to write with someone. Look at everything you can, and, but, but, but figure out the form. Figure out how it works and why it works. Figure out the stuff that you love. Figure out why the stuff you love works. Like think about it like being in a band where like you're gonna start playing cover songs in a garage with your friends and it's gonna teach you what song forms are and teach you what performances and all that stuff. But like, um, yeah, yeah. S start with dissecting everything and figure out and, and reverse engineer all of it and write in your notebook. I would take comics written by people that I liked. I'd take comics written by people that I hated. I would take comics that I loved, I took comics that I despised, I took comics that I was everybody else loved that I didn't understand. And I would like sit with them and write the script, write a script, like go page by page. Mm -hmm. Like, all right, so if I had to write this this page, how would I do it? All right, page one, panel one, it's this, it's that, and try to figure out all the different ways that you can I don't know, just take everything apart. Learn how it works. Like like get into it and do it all in notebooks and no one ever has to read it and no one ever has to tell you what they think of it. It's just a place for you to learn and then find an artist you can work with and start working. 
One hundred percent. Um, thank you guys so much for your yes. time for being here today. Um, if anyone is catching this live, make sure you hit the thumbs up on your way out. Subscribe to the channel for more comic book content. Tomorrow we have no weekly wrap up because it's my birthday. Happy um, birthday! Thank you, thank you. We got you a week off. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, not because we do have shows Tuesday and Wednesday this week. Um, we're gonna do a little birthday celebration Tuesday, and then we have archives dropping on Friday. We're gonna be doing the Ultimates by Mark Millar, Brian Hitch, one of our, another one of our favorite books. So, um, stay tuned for that. Um, other than other than that, thank you guys. If you're catching us on the replay again, I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, rare appearance of of Matt Fraction, Terry Dotson together on the air. Wow. Um, thank you. This Thanks, was guys. awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks for having for, us. Thanks for talking about Adventure Man. We appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. No problem, you See guys. In the funny pages. Yes. <laughs> Take care, you guys. Have a great rest of your week. Bye, y'all.